drought has always been a fact of life in the Southwest. The people of Chaco Canyon had weathered bad droughts before. And Jeff's tree ring data show that those droughts didn't stop the ambitious building. But in the 1100s, the drought did. Chaco is an eerie place with its own mysteries. Like how did its priests become powerful enough to get this huge ceremonial center built? Archie Hansen said one theory is that Indians came north from Mexico. Some archeologists think that they took over Chaco, terrorizing the people. I've been to Mexico. I know that the Toltecs and the Aztecs practiced bloody rituals of human sacrifice. I've seen the skull racks they'd fill with the remains of their enemies. Maybe this could explain why cannibalism suddenly appeared in Anasazi history. But it's just a theory. If only these stones could talk. But the Anasazi left us no written records. Was Chaco the scene of grisly rituals that spread throughout the Anasazi world? Today, some archaeologists are seeking answers to Chaco's mysteries in the smaller communities which help supply the great city. Dr. John Kantner and his archaeology students from Georgia State University are digging at one of these ruins. I'm hoping John will be able to tell me more about what happened uh, nice at Chaco. Uh, what is this site that you guys are excavating? Well, this is a small household. Uh, this community here, which we call Blue Jay Community, probably had three dozen of these small households, maybe four dozen of them. And Chaco is 50 miles. Yeah, it's a give or take. It's a right, exactly that it's way. Pretty, exactly. How then? How then does this site give you clues into the rise and fall of Chaco culture over there? Chaco Canyon has very little of, of its own in the canyon. Uh, there is a little bit of water there. They certainly could support some farming. But as far as other resources, there's just not, not a lot that's there. It's in the middle of nowhere. It's one of the most desolate places you'll find in the entire Pueblo and Southwest. These communities over here are much better positioned. There's a bit, it's a bit wetter here. There's more raw stone materials. There's more wood. And so these people here were the ones that were carrying a lot of the goods into Chaco Canyon to fuel it. Everything that Chaco did had to be fueled by people coming from outside of the area. People in small villages just like this. So the people here have what they need. People here have what they need, exactly. And what does the Chaco culture have that these people need? Yeah, that's a great question. That's what we're sort of trying to figure out exactly. Uh, I think that most archaeologists would agree that Chaco eventually becomes a pretty powerful pilgrimage center, one espousing a religious belief uh, that these people seem to, to uh, adhere to. What the Chacoans' religion was, nobody knows for sure. Many archaeologists believe it had a dark side. That could explain the instances of cannibalism and why people would walk 50 miles just to get close to its power. People uh, believe so much in whatever it is that Chaco is doing that they're willing to carry goods to Chaco, fuel its, uh, its very existence. And then I think Chaco Canyon began to do what we anthropologists call materialize that religious belief system. And by materializing, what they do is they create things. You create things, and if those things are important for the, for the religious belief system, for the rituals, for the ceremonies, then that means that it can be controlled. Other people need those things. Turquoise and shell, and for people out here, they felt they needed those things. And so in order to get those things, they had to go there, and they probably then brought things to Chaco Canyon in exchange for just a little piece of that belief system, a little piece of the religion that they can bring back here to their small communities and then help to fuel what they thought was going to be success here. As I look around John's dig, I'm reminded again that archaeology is painstaking work, piecing together answers from bits of pottery, turquoise, and bone. The simplest of questions can often take years to answer, and even then, there's always room for debate. John, you've given me a good sense of how this community related to the Chaco culture, but how did it all fall apart? Well, the priestly leaders of Chaco Canyon, their power and authority was based on a belief system, and that's really all they had. So it's really a house of cards, and if any of those cards are removed, then the whole thing comes falling down. Which was the one card then that did that? 
In the early 1100s, there was a, a drought. It was a relatively minor drought, particularly in comparison to other droughts that Pueblo people have experienced. Mm -hmm. But it probably was just enough to cause the problems. But essentially, there's a power vacuum, and that leads to a lot of social chaos. But did social chaos mean violence? I asked John, was this what drove the Anasazi to take refuge in the cliffs? In certain parts of the Puebloan world, that's exactly what happens. The violence and the, and the strife that results from this power vacuum leads people to retreat into those kinds of refuges. Moving north to places like Mesa Verde. Exactly. What John says makes sense. Think of the thousands of people abandoning Chaco, looking for shelter elsewhere in the Four Corners. Competition must have been fierce. It's not hard to imagine that it was brutal, too. It's time to put the pieces of the mystery together. But there's one last clue I need to explore.